This Veterans History Project interview is being conducted on uh, Tuesday, July the 14th in the year 2009 here at the Niles Public Library in the group study room in the Reference Services Department. My name is Neil O'Shea, I'm a librarian here at the Niles Library, and I'm speaking with Judith A. Carlson. Um, and Judith is here on behalf of her uh, father, uh, Norman Berkman, who was uh, born on the 20th of August, 1917, uh, and sadly passed away on March the 31st, um, 2008. Um, his uh, memoir of service is, uh, is interesting and uh, unique to our collection at this time, and it's it's um, it's really unfortunate that we're not able to interview uh, Mr. Uh, Berkman, but we heartily concur with his daughter that his uh, his story is uh, well worth knowing about and remembering and learning from. Um, Mrs. Uh, uh, Judith's remarks here are um, based on her possession and command of extensive files and documentation, uh, which are father compiled over the years uh, relating to his two uh, tours of duty in Europe uh, and she also uh, benefited from uh, uh, a special experience with her dad when he told her all about his experiences uh, in the war shortly before he died in March of 2008. Um, and uh, Judith has prepared for this interview uh, by developing an, a statement uh, which I think is a, a great way to lay out the salient facts before we um, discuss them in greater detail. So uh, at this point, I'd like to ask uh, Judith if she could read in the outline of her uh, dad's record of service. Okay. Um, my father enlisted in the Army at the Army's request in June of 1945. He basically said he was drafted to enlist. He told me that a friend of his, whose name he never told me, but I think was from his old neighborhood, was in the counterintelligence corps. And they were apparently looking for people who could speak Russian and or German. The friend named my father, who understood Russian well, spoke it a little, and spoke and understood Yiddish very well. So when my father agreed to enlist, they sent him up to a farm in northern Wisconsin to turn his Yiddish into German. After that, he was deployed to Germany, and under cover of being a musician, as, his German, as one of his German identity cards names him, uh, he became a spy. The highlight of that tour of duty was his participation in the retrieving of some German crown jewels in 1946. I have the documentation and pictures of those crown jewels. Also, sometime during that tour of duty, he was issued a German identity card showing that he was placed in Dachau as a political prisoner. He never was in Dachau. Apparently, though, he was in a displaced persons camp. Uh, I have a German identity card showing that. His German identity was Norman, N-O-R-M-A-N-N, -N, Bergmann. B-E-R-G-M-A-N-N. -N. They changed the K to a G and added an N to both of his first and last names. He didn't say too much about this tour of duty, except that part of his job in the DP camp was to ferret out German spies who were, as he put it, and this is a direct quote from him, on the wrong side of the divide. Uh, and identify mid to high-ranking officers as, again, a quote from him, hiding in the DP camp. He also often went undercover in the civilian sector. In this last, he said something about stopping sabotage, but I'm not at all clear about that. Also during that particular time in the civilian sector, he met the woman who was ended up being my stepmother, uh, when he needed uh, cover of a wife. She was working for the United States Army and she was his cover and she did in his second tour of duty did in fact become his wife. He also did finally admit that he was an interrogator but would say nothing more about it. And it wasn't until after his death that I believe this gentleman really was 
the Army documentation is very clear about that. However, from what I've read regarding some of the interrogation techniques used by the Army during the Cold War and, you know, during World War II, I now am pretty sure why he wouldn't say anything more. He didn't want his eldest daughter to know what he might have done. After he was discharged in 1947, he remained in the Army Reserves at 5th Army Headquarters in Chicago. During that time, from what I can glean of the papers I have, he might have worked as an instructor and lecturer. I do remember a couple of times going to headquarters with him because he said he had to give a talk. I never heard the talks, however, as I was put in an office with a coloring book crayons and books to keep me occupied until he was finished with whatever it was he was doing. There I also have papers that show he was schooled in military law and in the Geneva Convention. He then returned at his request, uh, probably to go back and get my stepmother, uh, to active duty in August of 1950. I have Army correspondence indicating that from about February to April of 1951, it was requested that he be returned to the Counterintelligence Corps. I'm not positive I understand these papers very well. Uh, they're written in Army abbreviations, but it seems that he was refused and in the end was deployed to Germany again under the office, auspices of the Military Intelligence Service. All he would say about that tour of duty was that he gathered intelligence that was useful to the United States, alluding to the fact that he couldn't say anything more as it was all still, quote, top secret. He was then discharged finally in August of 1953, and that was the end of his um, army tours of duty. Um, I will say he was so proud of being a spy that when he got on the internet sometime in the late 1990s, his screen name was xspy on webtv.com. Wow. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Now, you, you, when your dad entered the service, was he living in Chicago? Yes, he was. 817 uh, West Cornelia. 8? Eight? 817 West Cornelia. That would be yeah, he was Lake still, New or He was somewhere. still married to my mother, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do you know where he went to high school? or? Uh, actually, no, I do not, but I can find that if, if you want me to bring that back no, up. Um, I'll just call my uncle. Yeah, he knows it's interesting sure. to see the, the neighborhoods and where people came from. Um, and do you know what, what he was doing at the time he was uh, mm -hmm. showing up? What was oh, it? yes. He was a musician. And he was also teaching music at the Wurlitzer Piano Company downtown. Yeah. So he was, um, having been born in 1917, mm -hmm. and then entering the Army in 1945, he would have been, I think, almost almost 28. He was 27 years of age. Yes. That's right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and so had a wife and a child, so he was too—he was not eligible to be drafted. That's why he was drafted to enlist. On the recommendation of this friend uh, of, of his, his friend, I do not know the friend's name. Uh, and do you know if the friend was skilled in languages also? Yes. Or? Yeah. Yes, he said that that was why, because they used to speak a uh, little Russian with each other and a lot of Yiddish. The friend was also Jewish. Yeah. So. In Germany at that time, after the war, with the Russians and the Allies sharing the occupation of, mm -hmm. uh, of uh, Germany and Berlin, uh, his language skills must have been very must have been needed. They were wanted. very yeah. much needed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, did your dad ever talk about uh, boot camp or anything like that, or training experiences, or adjusting to life? Basically, in the Army? he said his boot camp went by so quickly. Yeah. that he didn't even notice it. Yeah. Um, apparently because he was basically going almost directly into CIC. Yeah, he was going into the... Yeah. The yeah, I mean, he got the training. The um, training, and, he, and then he, when he comes out in 1947, he's already, he comes out as a staff sergeant. Correct. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, do you know where he went for... Uh, for um, his basic training or anything like that, or both times Fort Riley. Fort Riley, what I Kansas, understand, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Um, and then uh, he's in fact, I remember telling him one of my grandsons lives in Kansas. And when I told my father, I said, hey, one of your great-grandsons lives in Kansas. He says, oh, Kansas. He says, Fort Riley, both times. That's all he said. <laughs> and then he's posted to Germany. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you, mm -hmm. you went over on a ship or a plane. He or, did go over on a ship. On a ship. He said the ship came out of, I think he said Maryland or Maine. Mm -hmm. I'm not too positive of that. He took a train, I know, east, um, because he tried calling my mother from the train station when he was being deployed, and she didn't answer. And, of course, we now know why. Yeah. So he was posted to the, or his unit was the 970th uh, Counterintelligence Corps. Counterintelligence Corps. Corps. There and that was, and that was in, uh, which is going to work, which will add to this uh, mm -hmm. transcript. Uh, looks like it's the sleeping lion or something. It, to me, it looks like a lion. Yeah, kind of. In different. fact, his license plate in Florida, okay, was that. They only demand a rear license plate, so his front license plate was a copy of that. That's how proud he was. I can say it. That indicates that it was something he was proud of, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, very much so. Yeah. And not too many people could have done that job either, I suspect. So, um, so then his initial mission in Germany is where he's posted to Berlin, I suppose. Isn't yes. It? And his, 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 his initial Berlin. mission is to kind of go undercover with these identification yeah. papers and see if he can sniff he out any Germans. Sniff who's out any Germans and sniff Nazis out any. Or, he did say traitor Russians, but Russians aren't traitors, so I don't know. Oh, <laughs> Russians who might have collaborated. Well, or remember, some. right. Yeah. Collaborators. Yeah. Um, or, yeah. 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 But, of course, he would never believe there were any, having, you know, a Russian background himself. You know, at that time, according to him, Russians were wonderful and Germans were horrible <laughs> across the board. But can't blame him. So, um, so when he's on duty then in his first tour, he's in civilian clothes, right? Yes, he is. And I wonder, Even up to and through the retrieval of the crown jewels. Yeah. So I wonder, does he, for example, have an apartment or does he... He did have an apartment. He said it was in a half bombed out. Um, Probably a lot of those places. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, three stories, no running water. And that was at the time Alga was covering as his wife. Okay, he was out in the nightclubs playing music. He played music on the street. My father played the accordion. So he used the, his musicianship as part of his cover. As part of his cover. Yeah. Yes. Very, yeah. very definitely. So Olga, did she have an interesting history in Germany? She Had she lost her family during the war and needed to, to protect her okay. from the Americans or something? Um, no. Her mother was alive. They were... Oh, from what Olga told me at one time, but this was many years ago, uh, her mother and her, her mother escaped. Her brother was SS. She did not like the fact that her brother was SS and she went over to the American side. She did not like what the Nazis were doing and of course this would bear fruit in the fact that she married an American Jewish GI. Yeah. So she was not from a Jewish background. Also. Oh, absolutely not. Yeah. No. And then did the brother survive the war, the SS man? Uh, no, he did not. He did not survive the war. So. Okay. Yeah. The, um, so the, we mentioned it, the, your, your dad in describing. By the way, her mother survived the war, but the brother did not. But she remained in Germany, did she? She remained in Germany. She came for a visit. It was an interesting visit, <laughs> I will say that. You remember it? Oh, yeah. What year was the end of it? Oh, I don't know, but I do remember my grandmother, my father's mother, being introduced to her, and she spoke enough English to get across, and they were talking about their sons, my father and, of course, my stepmother's brother, who was SS, and the old lady was so proud, she showed a picture 
to my grandmother of her son in his SS uniform. I give my grandmother credit. credit. My grandmother looked and said, he's a handsome boy, went to the bathroom and threw up. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think that my stepmother's mother was an American collaborator. I think she just survived the war. Now, whether she survived the war because her daughter was an American collaborator, I have no idea. Yeah. But I did meet the woman. Wow. She gave me the chills, but that should be off the record. <laughs> so the um, the highlight, uh, you, you, I think your 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 dad used the expression or the, we described it as such, and you do too. The highlight probably of this of this first tour of the duty was this recovery of the crown jewels. Yes. How did that come about? What happened was he was apparently stationed at the border, okay, as he called it, the correct side of the divide, and the um, that account is kind of, okay, we're not sure. Well, he's sure. Um, mm -hmm. Correct. So this were, these were the crown jewels? Of Those were the crown jewels. Duchess Theodora of Sachsen Weimar Eisenach. Wow. Okay, apparently the Duchess had hired um, a mercenary, a smuggler, or whatever to go and get her crown jewels. Uh, he got caught at the border. Bringing them out to her. Bringing she had fled out the zone or whatever. Her. She had fled the zone. He got caught by the Americans and the Russians coming out. And he told them what was going on. And uh, my father said that the Russian command right there and the American command said, you know, she got out. She really didn't do anything. Why don't we get them to work? Uh, that was done be without, really, the, the uh, permission of my father's commanding officer, whose name I do not know. Apparently, someone said, okay, we're going to do this, and sent, the Russians said, nah, we don't want to do it. Why don't one of you Americans go? One of the Americans went back with the smuggler, because he already knew where everything was, and they got them all out. Uh, my father alluded to the fact that he was the one. A newspaper account doesn't name it. And a book in which there is a chapter regarding bribes of crown jewels also does not name the actual person. I don't know. However, uh, in my entire life, you know, my dad died when I was 66. I'm now 68. I've never known him to tell a lie. So, I don't know, but it is it is possible because that was the type of adventurous thing my father would have done. Is that a wrap? Yeah, we're going back. Let's go get him. Uh, yeah. Well, he had the language skills to do it, and he had the language skills to do it. Yeah. You know, and as you can see from the pictures on his German passport or German identity papers, uh, he also had, you know, he could look Russian, he could look German, he could yeah. look American. Yeah. So they managed to get out, and they did get all the crown jewels. He said it took two trips. The original smuggler, who was caught, and then two more trips with whomever went back with the smuggler to get them out. And they did get them all out, according to the Duchess. I wonder how far it was, whether it was an overnight uh, kind of... Uh, yes, it was. It was overnight. Yeah, he said it took them about six hours, seven hours, to get into the whatever small town. I would imagine, you know, she was the crown uh, yeah. duchess of, you know, Sachsen Weimar Eisenach. So he did say Sachsen, but I don't know what that means. Okay? I have no clue. Yeah. Okay? I, I have no idea. So your dad earns the World War II victory medal. Mm -hmm. Victory ribbon, and then he's discharged in 1947. Yes. January of 47, and he comes reserve back to Chicago and joins the reserves. Back to Chicago with my stepmother. Join the reserves. This is after the first tour of duty, is it? Uh, 
Oh no, I'm sorry. I'm confused. Yeah. No, he came back and joined the reserves. Um, so we didn't have any divorced my mother when he came and, back. And, right. So that there's always a question like when the veteran returns from a combat yeah. situation to civilian life, sometimes there, there's a difficulty yeah, he in moved, adjusting. But he moved back with my grandparents for so a little really, while. He really changed his life. In oh, itself. he totally changed his life. Uh, before he enlisted on that first tour of duty, he owned a music shop. Uh, they sold music, records, uh, Vitrolas, everything. And Is that on Cornelia, in the area of Cornelia? Halston, Cornelia, right yeah. on Halston. In fact, I have pictures of that shop, which I didn't, I don't yeah. think that's important. Yeah. Um, and he left my mother to take care of it. One of the things that caused the divorce, not only was that she cheated on him, but the fact that her father decided a woman should not be working, put up a horrid fuss about her trying to keep that little radio shop open, and ended up, it failed. So my father comes back from his first tour of duty. His business is kaput. It's gone. It's gone. And that did not help. You know the divorce at all. No money, and then, but then you're, and then yeah, the reserves might have helped a little bit, I suppose. Yeah. So when he came back, he moved. He and my mother moved in with my grandparents, uh, along with me, um, and that did not last long. And I do remember my father leaving. I remember the day he left. And my mother was screaming and hollering, and what do you mean? You were unimportant. There, you didn't do anything in the army. Um, and that was it. And he moved, and I think he moved up north to Elston Avenue. Um, I'm not sure. He. Oh no, I take it back. I am sure. He moved in with his middle brother, the one who is now still living, into Albany Park. And he stayed with him while he was in the reserves. And then from there, he enlisted into a second tour of duty. And then when he got out of the Army, he and my stepmother moved up to Elston Avenue near Elston and Lawrence. Yeah. I mean, he has a pretty exciting life in the, uh, mm -hmm. an exciting life in mm -hmm. final days of World War II, beginning of the Cold War, and status, then he comes back to Chicago and then Yes. Business is and failing. find everything is okay. gone. Everything is gone, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the man my mother was cheating with, his name was George. <laughs> so for years, anytime something that we didn't, anyone in my father's family, you know, me, whatever, anytime there was something that we really didn't like, he says, well, by George, it happened again. <laughs> what a great sense of humor, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the... Um, the second time, he's not. He doesn't get into. He's, he he doesn't uh, isn't accepted into counterintelligence. He winds up in military intelligence. Correct. And that's when he completes all these special uh, all these various courses. Yeah. yeah. Basically, okay, um, okay. This, yeah, December 1950, April 1953. Um, let's see. When is this dated? August 4th, 1953, uh, guest speaker to the Troop Information Program pertaining to Europe. So his experiences apparently, uh, subject material, narrative. He was pretty good. He was pretty good talker. Um, the Army General School, June, uh, June 1951 to August. to August. Yes, he has to August 1951. Um, as an interrogator. So when he went back, and then of course we have the. So he's posted again to Germany when he was back. He's posted again to Germany. So language skills, and he he's said interrogating. At his request. Mm -hmm. I think with his skills, he didn't really need to request it. Yeah. But he did request it because there was Alda sitting there, and he promised she he'd come back for her. And of course, everybody says he's never coming back. He's never he did. Oh, so that's, so you think, do you think you're, I mean, I, this is, what? the question just suggests itself, I hope it's not rude. Do oh, you, not at all. Do you think your, your father returned to America after the first tour of duty, and he really did think he was going to go back and, and? No. 
It was an option, no, but it, I asked him that question. Oh, wow. I wow. did ask him. I said, Dad, I said, I know my mother was cheating on you. Mm. I said, but did you go back for your second tour of duty to get Olga, and were you planning on, on doing that? And he said, no, I wasn't planning on doing it. He said, but when I came back, found the business gone, yeah. found out I had to move in with my in-laws, things were not working out, it was confirmed that your mother was still cheating on me with George. He said, I was already in the reserves, he said, and I decided to go back into active duty and go back and get Olga. He said, I was going to forget about her, he told me. He said, but the circumstances? No. no. So I wonder, if he would have been in, when he was, uh, so he's back in, back in, in Germany mm -hmm. in 1950. 1950. Uh, and on the second tour of duty, he serves until 1953. Correct. Uh, and then, did he also did he marry when he, he married when he was in Germany? He married on December second. Where is it? It's here, I have it. Um, where the heck is it? I just had it in my hand. Uh huh. He married on December fourth, nineteen fifty-two, in Passau. So then they they had to live together uh, mm -hmm. for another. Uh, yeah, I months, I know? have absolutely no idea what all these abbreviations yeah. mean. But he was married. Okay. They married it's authorized him. to move dependent below from Passau, Germany, to dependents assembly area, et cetera, with a report date of December 4th, oh, 1942. No, he married her before then. I'll have to get 52, right? I so mean, 52. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I will have to... Did he, ever, did he say who he was interrogating there? Was it Were they Germans or Russians? Uh, or he Russians? said he was mostly interrogating Germans. It was mostly Germans, uh, some German civilians. Um, but as I said, you know, in, in that one, he was... He, he was he didn't talk much. Yeah, I suppose by that time the, the, chill, the, chill the chill of the Cold War is really yeah. setting in. Yeah, and I asked him, I said, at that point, I said, what about communism? Did you, was communism any part of uh, what you were taking place in? And he said, no, not really. Not really. I said, well, I thought that by then, as far as the SS or the Germans, I said, I thought that it was basically over. Yeah. And he said, no, it wasn't. He says, but I can't tell you much about that. He says, because I think it's still top secret. Yeah. So I have no idea. Yeah, of course, so there, there, there were still all kinds of German war criminals to hunt down in 1950. And I think that's what he was probably doing. Yeah. yeah. Because he said, no, it had nothing to do with communists. <coughs> so I said, OK. So then. Uh, So then your dad comes back to comes back to the United States, back to Chicago with his new German bride, and then he adjusts to life. Adjusts to life in Chicago. Very yeah. well. Yeah. Eventually moved out to um, Carpentersville. Remained a musician for the rest of his life. On the accordion, the accordionist. Yeah. He played anything that had a keyboard, and put the addition of a harp because all that is is a piano without the keyboard. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he taught piano. He, I have been told, don't know, I would have to check with Harper College, that he helped institute the adult music uh, classes at Harper College yeah. on the college level. Did he, so he never had to uh, consider using the GI Bill or anything like that, did he or didn't? No. Know? And did he, uh, did he, did he? Meet like, um, uh, did he have any wartime buddies or military service friends no. that he stayed in touch with? Or? No, I asked him about that. However, when he did married my stepmother, she already did have a daughter. Um, Ellen married, um, who's now, my, of course, my brother in law, Abe, um, and Abe was a survivor. Um, of the camps. So it was, you know, it was really strange 
the only wartime friend he had was Abe, who was liberated, okay, and continued to work for, you know, and my mind is so messed up. This is my sister and brother-in-law, which I, I can't remember the last names. Well, it, this is where it's okay for the you know private. But no, students. my father no, because I did ask him about that. I says, what about the guys? He says, you know, he says, I don't know if any of them survived. So if Abe was a survivor and he was in a camp, was he Jewish? He was in a camp, oh yes. So he was Jewish. Yes, he was Jewish. So Olga, and who wasn't Jewish. Who was not Jewish. Her married, daughter. Her daughter. Her daughter married, married a Jewish, Jewish man. Gentleman. In fact, Ellen converted. Yeah, and, and then and then Olga marries a, a Jewish man. So it's it, Well, Olga married a Jewish man first. Yeah, so it's and it's then kind of her yeah. It's it's uh, yeah. fascinating. Strange. Yeah. Olga never converted. Yeah. Never converted. In fact, my, you know, it, I have a half-brother, a half-sister, and a stepsister. We don't refer to each other that way. Yeah. <laughs> okay? Yeah, yeah. You know, we're sisters and brother, and, and this is it. Um, so those are the, yeah, those are the new social relations as a result of World right. War II. Right, it's, it's um, very interesting. Yeah. But no, he... So he didn't, he didn't wasn't done... Uh, joining veterans organizations or... No. Yeah. And I did ask one thing of my father that I found very interesting because I had heard that many, many, many World War II veterans refused to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, Dad, I said, here I am, I'm 66 years old. Why now? Why are you telling me now? And he said, because I wanted to not all die with me. Why didn't you tell me before, Dad? He said, I don't know. It brings back such terrible, terrible memories. And when he was speaking to me about many of the things, the crown jewels, a little bit about the interrogation, the civilian, he actually did have tears in his eyes. I'm so sure. I know there is a lot. And he said that he, he really never wanted to talk about it. Yeah. Um, can you... Speaking for your your, your father here, uh, how do you think? Well, his military service and experience has greatly affected his life. I mean, oh, very, very much so, very, very much so. As I said, his email address was ex spy on mm -hmm. web TV. Very, very much affected his life. Um, and but the fact he could not um, he could not watch any movies or read any books basically having to do with the SS, Hitler, I'm, I mean, I remember that very, very distinctly, very distinctly. Yeah. It affected him so badly. Um, I'm not too sure if it affected him that badly because he was Jewish or because of his personal experiences. Yeah, maybe both, yeah. Probably both yeah. would be my guess. Did, did, how do you think his military experience influenced his thinking about war or about the military? He hated it. He hated war altogether. Yeah. As far as he was concerned, every single country in the world should devolve, dissolve its military. He said war, he fully agreed with the, um, what was it, the hippie philosophy? You know, or who was it? Patton or somebody who said war is hell? Yeah. You know, make love, not war. Yeah. War is no good for any living being, yeah. if there are any living beings left afterwards. My father was totally against war. My father wouldn't even have an argument with somebody that was heated. Yeah. His parents would probably subscribe to that view also, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I have papers, um, if I can rest them for my cousin, my grandmother wrote uh, some stories about some pogroms when she was a child. Only two have been translated into Russian. Yeah. My cousin has the rest, and they have not been translated. Because um, okay. I think socialists of that oh, yeah. generation or that time, they're very much internationalists. In well, I remember two boxes in my grandmother's house, okay? One for the socialist charity and the other one for the Zionist charities. 
Okay, and when I was a child, they used to take me out to the Indiana sand dunes to, they had a permanent quote-unquote tent that was shared. Well, my mother's family found out that it was actually a socialist camp. And uh, they wouldn't let me go anymore, but it was so much fun. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is there... Thank you for being so so generous with the details of your Thank father's father life and the personal. Thank you for being so generous. Yeah. All right. Then, is there anything? The is there anything? Anything else you feel like we should add to the interview? I mean, I, I know you already typed everything out, and then we we've, we've discussed some really? general questions that we asked the uh, veterans. Um, really not. I mean, he told me a lot. Yeah. Um, I took notes. They didn't have to be copious notes because he had a memory that was unbelievable. Um, and so do I, <laughs> right along with it's it. It's evident, it's evident, yeah. Yes, and he had all this documentation that when I looked at it, I went, whoa. So if I can get these, these documents scanned and properly captioned, um, that, uh, and your remarks here today, will, will give us uh, some understanding right. and, and these appreciation. Are, and these are the ones from the second tour of Julie. Second that tour. That need scanning. This is not. Okay. So we can... Do that. Well, at this point, then, I thank you very much for coming in and giving us a, a very interesting thank interview you for having me. about a very interesting man. Yeah, who said and an served his country twice. An extremely interesting man. Served his country twice. twice. Yes. Although I really do think the second time he served his country was a little bit more hormones towards my woman to be my stepmother. But again, he was going to be an honorable man until he came yeah. home and actually the you know what hit the fan. And he wasn't about to do that. Well, I'll, I'll hit the button now. <laughs> okay. Okay. When I.